Okay. Put your light down. So, hello. Anyone can see my line? It's okay. Randy Ryan is getting one. It's quiet, but okay. Okay. Um, well, I'll try to project a bit more. Yeah, yes. Yeah. No, no, not all right. Thanks. Um, okay, so th this is sort of the latent variable model approach, or relevant to what comes later. So the right way of framing it is you have these latent skills for players, which we don't observe directly, but through the results of matches, we sort of get some idea of what they should be. And we leave in some hyperparameters data to sort of let us uh, adjust things in various ways. Okay. Uh, and so one question you can ask about this is if I take this model of the skill rating problem, is it appropriate that a player's skill level be something static? Okay. W whether it should be time bearing or whether you can reasonably model it as being constant. Okay. And so a basic answer, depending on what sports you're interested in, is perhaps probably not. Okay. There's various sports where if you look at what the league table was 10 years ago, it is not going to be an accurate reflection of how things look now. And so to some level, you know, you would be missing out by using that sort of a an approach. And, and that's which is perhaps more principled is to frame it as a model selection problem, right? That you try to write down some model where you do have temporal dependence of skills, and then you see whether it gives you better predictive performance or whether it's sort of preferable from other model selection points of view. And so empirically, there's various sports in which it is indeed a worthwhile thing to do. So that's sort of uh, something we're going to proceed with going forward. Now, um, there's many ways of having dependent skills over time. Uh, the simplest choice in a way is to have a, a Markov structure for the skills. So sort of, you know, my skill today depends on my skill yesterday, but if you know my skill yesterday, the rest of the past doesn't matter. Okay. And so this combination of sort of uh, Markov chain evolutions for the latent skills and then indirect observations independently across time is what's called a state space model or, you know, in some contexts, a hidden Markov model. It's sort of uh, more or less the same thing. So this is the approach you take. So one way of visualizing it is through a picture that you sort of see in you know, many books on graphical models and this sort of a thing. So through time, we have you know, the player's skills evolving without strong dependence on their past. So that's this XK is the skills, right? And then these YKs are the results of the matches on a given match day, let's say. And so on the left hand side, we have the joint line. So we have a very nice sort of separate structure here. Um, and in cases where X and Y is sort of reasonably low dimensional, you can handle things quite nicely in terms of computing life. So, um, now, for us, we have a bit of a difficulty in that our state X, right, the skills, it's not one player's skill, but it's really all players' skills. And so even if you have a very simple model for one player's skill, the joint model for all of them can be quite complex. And so we need some way of handling that. Because, you know, the statistics are large, but maybe uh, especially for state space models, working with high dimensional latent states might make life very difficult for us, okay? But what's fortunate for us is that we have quite a bit of structure to the model beyond what's written in the first page, right? Is that the interaction between different players is only really happening during matches, okay? We sort of don't necessarily expect that they're training together or something like this. And so um, bearing this in mind, it's sometimes uh, appropriate to model player skills as uh, evolving sort of dependently in time, but independently across players, okay? And so this leads to what's called a factorial state space model or a factorial model, essentially referring to the fact that the uh, transition density is factorized across players. Um, and so that's about the dynamics. There's also an important observation that the way in which we observe their skills factorizes across the matches that happen, right? On a given day, you're not playing many matches against many people. So that's a useful simplification for us going forward. <clears throat> and so in this case, we have a sort of slightly more elaborate graphical model, but it's something that scales very nicely to when we have many players. Okay, so here, each of these horizontal lines up here is the skill of evolution of a single player. And you see that player one skill is evolving by itself, as is players two, three, and four, and so on. And so we see here on the first match day, the players one and two play, and we have the observation of that match down here. On the next match day, one and three play, and so on. Okay, and so we still have a sort of sparse graphical model. Um, but it induces some extra complications. It's not quite as clean as a field space to Okay, so one benefit of this formulation is it lets us handle uh, you know, large numbers of players in the competition in a sort of uh, in a way where the complexity doesn't blow on exponentially. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
Are you ever going to want YK to feed back into SK plus one? Uh, so, in the sense that you would say the result of a match causally influences the skill of the player. Okay. So we tend not to do that. Um, it's something one could think about, but I think it makes the graph quite a bit more complicated than some of Okay. So to these again, it's all pretty abstract so far, and so. The, the reality is in many of these models, the choices for this, uh, these likelihoods and these dynamics can be quite simple, okay? So when we have continuous skills, very common choices are that skill evolves in time as a Brownian motion, right? There's just sort of unbiased noise being added at infinitesimally. Um, if you're interested in models where the, the sort of skills of each player sort of stay stable in time, they're sort of not blowing up as the time horizon goes up, uh, you can use a mean reverting process like an Ornstein Ullenbeck process. Again, this is sort of they're very convenient to work with because they're all Gaussian processes and Markov processes. So many nice conjugacy properties all there. Um, equally, you can choose to uh, model skills as being discrete, right? So one example of that would be in many sports games, right? You have uh, your player's skills are ranked from one to a hundred when you're putting a team together. Right? This is video games, not real sports, no way, but um, that's that's sort of something which is happening implicitly. In this case, you need some sort of dynamics for the skills. And so one simple choice is a reflected random walk where basically at each step in time, your skill either stays constant, goes up by one, unless it sort of leaves the upper boundary or goes down by one, unless it would be leaving the bottom boundary, okay? And so in a way, it's sort of a discrete analog with the same idea, but with slightly different boundary behavior. Um, yeah, and so, there's, there's many things you can do beyond this, but this is just to make it concrete. You know, these would be some very simple things to try. They're the basis of some sort of already popular models. Um, now I'll move on to the observations from here. So uh, here I give some very simple versions wherein uh, the observations are sort of uh, discreetly labeled. So it's things like home team wins, away team wins, etc. Of course, you can extend this to sort of more rich observation models where you get the score and stuff as well. Mathematically, it doesn't make so much of a difference, but in terms of presentation, it's useful if I can just uh, keep it finite in this way. And so uh, given sort of real valued skills, a very common way of uh, modeling the results of a match would be to say, given the skill of the home team and the away team, the probability that the winner of the match is the home team is obtained by looking at the difference between those skills and passing it through a sigmoidal function. So something like a logit or a probit. Um, yeah, and so this is sort of related to what's called the bradley terry model, but it's sort of changing the likelihood in, in small ways. Um, yeah, for, for discrete valued skills, you can do the same thing, right? This, the sort of semantics of uh, this likelihood still make perfect sense. You might also want to do something sort of uh, non-parametric, where you parametrize the probability of winning given each skills directly, subject to some uh, monotonicity constraints. Um, again, in practice, it's relatively common to stick with these uh, basic models. Um, and it's worth mentioning that once you um, once you make the move to modeling everything probabilistically with likelihoods and so on, that the extension to other observation models where you have draws, you have extra observations like that is relatively straightforward. So, um, yep. the, the fact that you denote a home team and an away team, yep. is that just to restrict the state space that Y lives in to either H or A every single month? Yeah. Basically. Yeah, exactly. But basically, as long as you can write down a likelihood for what you observe conditional on the latent skills, then conceptually everything goes through all right. Yeah. yeah thanks. Okay. And so, so now we've sort of written down some models, and in principle, we can talk about you know beginning to do inference on the basis of that. But um, state space models, in some ways, they pose different challenges to sort of IID observations or regression models and so on. So it's worth commenting on what the new challenges are in this context. So um, before talking about it in statistical terms, maybe it's useful to talk about it in terms of decision making and the things that we would do with this information, right? So the first thing we might want to do in many cases is in real time, given the sort of history of matches that we've observed, predict what's going to happen next, okay? And so the standard way to do this would be to sort of look at your current estimates of the player skills and then you know pass them through a predictive model in some ways. And so uh, you need access to this quantity here, which is called the filtering distribution of the skills. So it's sort of your, the distribution over the skills of all players, given all the information up to the present. So that's an online problem, okay? Equally, um, if you wanted to do a sort of retrospective analysis, it's important to evaluate the past performance of players, but now you look at the distribution of the skills of the players at a given match date, but given all of the information up to the present, okay? So little k here could be you know a year ago, and big k could be today. Um, and then finally, another thing you, you would want to do is actually calibrate the parameters of your general model to the specific sports that you're working. Okay. 
And so to do this, you know, if you're interested in doing things in a likelihood-based way, which is what we focus on in this paper, in principle, you can do things differently. You need some way of getting estimates of this likelihood function as a function of the parameters to model. And so in a way, the task here is sort of likelihood estimation or more probably parameter estimation. Okay, so these are the, the tasks we sort of operationally need. And in some cases, you might want to just isolate these and solve them by themselves. But what's what's kind of true is that the state space models that's been a feedback that's been blocked here, that it's quite difficult to solve just one of these problems unless you have very strong knowledge of the problem a priori. Because essentially, um, to do good filtering, right, you're saying, given this parameter, this set of parameters, what is my belief of the player skills over time, right? If your model is misspecified and your parameter estimates are very wrong, then the results you get from running a filtering algorithm are not necessarily useful to you, okay? So to do filtering well, you need to have good parameter estimates. Um, then to the question of parameter estimation, to do this well, what you typically need to do is infer the latent states and sort of find parameters that jointly explain all of those very well. And to do, to do parameter estimation well, you typically need access to the smoothing distribution. And then finally, to do the smoothing distribution, you need the filtering distribution. Essentially, to sort of evaluate what's happening in the past, you need to have evaluated what's happening up to that point, then all of the other future information, and then you sort of propagate the information backwards in a way. And so um, th there are cases where you don't need to solve all problems. So for example, if you know the model parameters very well, you can really just do the filtering directly. And in sort of physical models, that's more common. But in statistical models, you tend to have to do parameter estimation as well. So are you assuming time consuming as well? So it's not crucial. In all of our models, we do. But um, yeah, I don't have anything particularly deep to say on that. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so one point I can make is that we typically formulate things in continuous time. And it will be homogeneous in continuous time, but we will have unequally spaced observations. Yeah. And so in that respect, it's non-homogeneous. Okay. That's a useful point. Um, yeah, so our takeaway is that if we want to sort of have a general workflow to how to handle these models, we'll try to solve all three of these tasks as well. We'll have you know some reports to make. Okay, so um, back to this problem of high dimension. So if we want to represent these filtering distributions, if we have many players. You, even if you have you know, 100 players and your skill levels are just zero and one, actually representing a joint distribution over their skills is not really feasible, right? It's sort of a, a massive cube in some ways. And so even representing the correlations between different players is typically very difficult. And so in practice, what people tend to do is you just reduce to tracking the skills of individual players. Okay? And then you say that somehow under a suitable weak dependence assumption, that's enough information to do things well. OK, and so, you know, another important thing is that it's computationally feasible. Now you're sort of, you know, representing 100 binary vectors instead of two to the 100 probabilities, which is much more feasible. It does incur some sort of statistical bias. Um, but as I sort of alluded to, there's some uh, mathematical results on when this bias is controllable. Essentially, what sort of decorrelation across uh, space and time is necessary to do this. And this is handled in Lorenzo's previous work. So that's so when you say for things to work out sufficiently well, is that then in the predictive sense? Like if you make the independence assumption, your predictions are not going to be that much worse. Yeah, so I, I believe the way that the result is formulated is that the error in the filtering distributions is controlled. And then this should propagate into how the error in the predictive distribution works. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we have to sort of think about algorithms. For solving these tasks again, it's still a bit abstract. Um, so for filtering, the object of interest is what I sort of write here is just filter k, and it's this distribution I told you about before, right? You guess it's what's happening right now, given everything in the past. And so to um, to construct the filtering distribution, there's sort of these abstract recursions for state-based models, which are the basis for almost all computations in these models, actually. Right. So the idea here is. Given your filtering distribution on today, your prediction of what's happening tomorrow is obtained by taking this distribution and propagating it through the system dynamics, which is sort of right in abstract here, where m k minus one k is sort of the dynamics from time k minus one to time k. Uh, and then separately, to go from the predictive distribution to the new filtering distribution, we sort of have this abstract assimilate step, which is a Bayesian update in a way. You observe the uh, likelihood g k, you multiply it by a density, and you go from that. Okay. And so to get go from one filter to another, you sort of do these two steps. And really, most practical filters are based around implementing these sort of abstract recursions in specific models, you know, whether it's sort of the Kalman filter or a particle filter or the forward algorithm and so on. It's all the, the same uh, backbone now. And so for smoothing, 
smoothing is sort of the distribution of the past given the present. So instead of iterating forward in time, you iterate backwards in time. Okay. And so the idea here is similar, that there's again these generic abstract recursions which you implement in specific ways. More or less what happens is you say, you know, given my smoothing distribution tomorrow and what was my filtering distribution of today at the time, I can sort of glue those together using uh, sort of conditional independence relations. And then I get the smoothing distribution over both of those days at the same time. And then I marginalize out the future day. Okay. And so you sort of uh, construct these backwards. And the specific details are not going to be important for the rest of the talk, but I think it's nice to show these things to say it's sort like of, you're relying on very abstract results, which are not specific to the skill working problem. Okay. And then uh, for parameter estimation, you know, we want this likelihood, at least in principle, certainly that's how we do things. Um, unless the model is very simple, this likelihood won't be available in analytical form. And so the way people tend to do parameter estimation here is based on what's called the EM algorithm. You know, if you've seen it before, I'm just sort of reminding you that it's here. And if you've not seen it before, it's sort of challenging to teach even if you have a full hour with some undergrads. So I'm not going to do it in sort of 30 seconds here. But the key thing is that, you know, uh, you replace the original optimization problem of the theta with a joint optimization problem over theta and sort of an estimate of the smoothing distribution. And then you alternately maximize each of these two things. And so essentially what happens is you optimize Q given theta. So you estimate the smoothing distribution of what's happened with fixed parameters. And then you use that as the basis for fitting new parameters to the model. You essentially account for the fact that you haven't observed the skills directly to estimate what the skills were. And then you propagate information for that. There are other ways of doing it beyond the end, but it's sort of one of the more generic and straightforward things to uh, talk about. <clears throat> okay, so all of those are again sort of generic within Markov models and space space models, but uh, we have a very specific structure, which is this factorial structure, and we're particularly interested in very large problems and, and sort of managing the post level and scale. Um, I think this actually, this is sort of related to what Max asked earlier. So um, anytime you see a little t or a big t, it's referring to continuous time. Anytime you see a little k, it's sort of a specific match day within that time. So we don't we don't assume that you know you observe a match every single day, but that they can be sort of inhomogeneously spaced on a different day. You could have different number of matches and so on. Um, so if you see k, that's sort of a specific match day. If you see t, that's a continuous time. But it shouldn't be too much of an issue. Yes. Okay. So scalability. This is sort of one of the key motivating uh, parts for the computational things that we derived. Yeah. So we're interested in the case of handling computations with many players. Um, because it's a state space model problem, you know, if people have experience with things like particle filters, the dimension does not have to be that high before standard methods go wrong. Okay. So even if we were only considering, you know, inference in the Premier League where you have 20 teams, you'd have to start considering the difficulties of high dimension to some extent. But we're sort of fundamentally just interested in even harder situations than that, like, you know, tracking what's happening at Wimbledon or in online gaming and stuff like this. So N is the number of players in our competition and one man scale well with N going to infinity. We're also interested in the high frequency setting where you have lots of matches happening, possibly at irregular times. And so that's this capital K going to infinity. So it's not sort of necessarily the real time going to infinity, but just the number of matches that have happened. Okay, and so uh, with this in mind, we focus mostly on that which can be implemented in an online fashion with sort of reasonable memory requirements and where the computational complexity scales linearly with both the number of players and, and the number of matches K. And I sort of comment that this is realistic and worthwhile in the sense that you can't really get much below this without throwing away statistical information. And it also turns out to be possible to do this. Okay, so it's somehow as good as we can expect to do, uh, and it will make this competition more nice for us. Okay. So, um, to, to handle this sort of large size limit, there's one approximation, and this is not something we propose. This is something where, if you read the literature, it is really happening in every method, whether they say it or not, is instead of tracking the joint distribution of all players' skills, we just track the marginal speech player skills over time. Okay, and so our representation of the joint distribution is just a product, right? Just an independence approximation. Um, yeah, and I, I call this an approximation, not an assumption, because it's about the algorithms, not about the model. Okay, it's the way we represent these things. Okay, and so we do it for the filtering distribution and also the smoothing distribution. And as I said, for under suitable sort of weak dependence assumptions, this is probably a sensible thing to do. Computationally, it's nice. Statistically, you don't lose that one quite so much. And and it, yeah, as I say, it, it opens various doors in a 
just algorithms that wouldn't otherwise be available for reasonable. Um, now another computational point. Um, so at any given time, you know, for, for reasonable observation models, any player is playing in at most one match. Now, unless you're sort of one of these lucky chess players who's playing a whole class of primary schools at the same time or something, it's sort of reasonable to make this assumption. And, and moreover, any match only involves two players, okay? So what it means is that when you get the result of a single match, you only update your beliefs about the two players who've been in that match directly. Okay, and this is sort of related to the approximations from before. So yeah, upon receiving the results, we just update the filtering distributions for these two players. If we were to update our distributions for the other players, it would just be saying what happens under the system dynamics, and we can sort of do that whenever we like. So this is sort of what I call match scarcity, right? A match only influences two of the players' skills, or it influences by. So the consequence um, of this basic observation, which is already nice by itself, is that if you receive the results of all the matches that happen on the same day, they are going to be made up of matches involving disjoint sets of players, right? And so you can do all of these updates independently of one another and in parallel. Okay, and so this is sort of how things work with the filtering distributions, but you can sort of trust me that the, that the smoothing distributions, much the same thing is true, okay? So somehow if you have parallelism available to you, even observing a lot of match updates can be done very quickly by distributing the populations. And so this is sort of very important for the scaling that we talk about later. Okay, so let, let's talk about what it looks like to update um, our filtering distribution based on a single observation. So what we do to obtain the filtering distribution at time k is we take our predictive distribution there and the likelihood gk that shows up and we assimilate them through the Bayesian update. So we have already made this approximation that the filtering distribution factorizes and that the system dynamics factorize, which means that our predictive distributions also factorize, okay? Moreover, we have that the likelihood factorizes across the games that are being played. And so what we have, so up here is opponents in the game. So what we can say is iterating over pairs of players who were opponents on match day K, you can update their joint filtering distribution by taking their joint predictive distribution and this likelihood and assimilating them, right? So instead of doing something which has the dimension of all the players that played on that day, it's a two dimensional problem. That's sort of just for L3 purposes. And this is really how we do things. Uh, and this is just saying it works. So to, to, to assimilate this, this one match in which players H and A play, we compute. What we do is we need, need to obtain the predictive distribution of the skills before the match. So what we do is we look at our uh, existing filtering distributions. We find the last time when they played, because we won't have updated the distributions otherwise. So you take the old distributions, you propagate those through the system dynamics, which could be for different amounts of time. Okay. You obtain the, the uh, predictive distribution of today. Then using uh, today's observation, you get the joint filtering distribution of them today, and then you decouple them again to get the marginal distributions. Okay, so we briefly manipulate something two-dimensional and then move back to a one-dimensional representation, and we get something that will be sort of a four representation. Okay, so um, I think now what I'm gonna talk about is specific ways in which this is done for different model classes. And a lot of these are things that existed already in the literature, right? And it's sort of, uh, yeah, just to illustrate things further, let's say. So there are many ways of solving this problem, and I can't review all of them, but I'm sort of presenting some relatively popular ones here in subjectively increasing order of statistical sophistication. So that matter, if you like. I want to talk about the practical performance in this section, that will come at the end. And we'll see that there's sort of not a uniform order of practice. So the first one I start with is one which will hopefully be uh, familiar to various people. It's the ELO rating system, which is sort of probably best known for being used to rank the chess players, but also you know many other forms of gaming. Uh, this is sort of what I would call a not quite statistical model. It sort of is mathematical in the way that things are done, but it's not done in the format of I write down you know a statistical model and then I do maximum likelihood inference, at least not explicitly. Um, you know, from the point of view of me and my co-authors reading this paper, that meant that we had to do a bit of work. But the flip side of that is that for people who play chess who don't care about maths, they can understand this method in a few minutes, at least, uh, you know, practically speaking. Um, so the way we would write things would be, you know, you model skills as being real valued. You have this sort of logistic regression type observation model for, for the responses. And what happens is you don't write down a likelihood per se. What you do is you just increment the player skills in a sort of stochastic gradient type way. Okay, so what, what, what happens here is that how do we update what's happening to the home team? Well, 
if they win the match, then we increase their skill by one minus the probability we gave to them winning that match with a sort of learning rate k here. And if they lose, then we decrement their skill by this sort of second probability. Okay. And similarly for the away team, you increment in the other direction. If you look at this carefully, you'll see that the sum of the player skills stays constant with time. So it's sort of the total amount of talent in the competition stays constant. Okay. Um, so there's a nice interpretation of this as sort of an online stochastic gradient method. So there's a certain Bradley Terry model. Um, so in that sense, it comes back to being statistical, but this is not the way it's always presented. Um, yeah, as I said, so you can think of it as, you know, we compare the outcome of the match to the predicted outcome of the match, and then use this as the basis for adjusting our estimates. Uh, a point which I think is nice to make is that if you look up how ELO is used in a few different competitions, this K is set differently. Okay, and it might be done heuristically, but in principle, this is somewhere where you can see that the statistical perspective might be useful. That sort of setting this K and the sensitivity to how players' skills change after one match could depend on the sporting question. And you could treat it as a parameter estimation class. Okay, and then now we sort of go to one of the one sort of popular refinement of this is what's called Glicker, which was uh, proposed, I think, in the late 90s by uh, Mark Glickman, who was sort of also interested in pairwise comparisons more generally in a medical context, I think. But okay, so here, here we sort of move away from ELO and we introduce an actual model. Okay, so we have that our, our skills are again real value, but instead of just tracking a point estimate of the skill in time, we're going to use a Gaussian distribution to represent our uncertainty of the player's skills. And so um, they use the system dynamics as being a Brownian motion. So over time, from time t to time s, what happens is that you add a sort of amount of Gaussian noise to your state, which is independent of the state. And they again use these uh, logistic observation models. So, um, so now we're in an interesting case. We have a state-space model with Gaussian dynamics with non-Gaussian observation models. So we can't use the Kalman filter, but we can use something sort of very similar called the extended Kalman filter. But the principle is essentially that the only bottleneck to using exact Gaussian conjugacy is that the likelihood is not Gaussian. And so what we do is we move into log space, we do a Taylor expansion to second order, pretend like it's a Gaussian, and then do that update exactly. And so that's, you know, for some people that's the Laplace approximation, for some people that's the extended Kalman filter, but it's certainly something that's sort of well established in various contexts, so it's not without its uh, shortcomings. But okay, so that's that's Glico, and that's sort of a simple step towards using sort of more model-based methods. Um, and yeah, and you can use it. And then they sort of, I think in the original paper, they do a bit of smoothing, but they don't do it in a way that would be considered standard somehow. But I think it's best not to let well happen. Okay, so um, so one one shortcoming of the Glico approach is essentially that. Okay, yeah, one shortcoming of the Glico approach is that you're sort of using a Taylor expansion on a likelihood which is very skewed. Okay, and so it's in, in a way, even though the method works and is implementable, um, it's somehow one of the worst case things for the, the extended common filter approach. And so one thing you can do instead is with more or less the same model, you replace the logit by a probit, but this is sort of a, a lower order issue. Instead of doing the assimilate step by making this uh, derivative based approximation, you make a moment based approximation. So you sort of compute using uh, explicit Gaussian integrals what the expected state is after the update, what the expected variance is, and then you fit a Gaussian to that. And that's sort of what's called expectation propagation. Um, but at its core, it's a moment matching method. Yeah, if you like. um, okay. So for the people who sort of talked to me about research before this, I spent a lot of time working on Monte Carlo methods as has a couple of my uh, collaborators. And so you can also say, all right, you know, these first two methods for the Gaussian model, they incur some statistical bias. In principle, I can consider using uh, particle methods essentially to get lower bias estimates of filtering distribution, but introduces some Monte Carlo error. So it's not the time to get uh, stuck into details of particle filtering, but one benefit of sort of this approach is you can handle fairly generic state spaces, you can handle fairly generic dynamical models as long as you can simulate from them, and you can handle fairly generic likelihoods provided that you can evaluate. Them. So these are pretty minimal uh, assumptions to make, and essentially all of these steps that would previously be done by sort of Gaussian conjugacy or this sort of stuff, you just do by simulation, right? You propagate the, the uh, estimates by using the system dynamics and you assimilate the data by an importance free sample tree. And then uh, finally, one thing we did, which was on the basis of uh, some of Lorenzo's work, was to use discrete tracking distributions for the player skills 
Um, so sort of modeling closed skills as being, you know, from one up to S, where S could be 100. We took it pretty large in many cases. Um, yeah, the system dynamics are a sort of Markov jump process. Okay, so we have a lot of flexibility in specifying those. And the observation models are fairly generic. Again, in practice, we used sort of things quite similar to the previous uh, examples. And now the propagate and the similar steps are still more or less done exactly, but they're sort of, you know, the exact tricks that come from discrete space models rather than Gaussian models. So going from the filtering distribution to the prediction distribution is just a matrix multiply. And there's sort of similar things for the uh, assimilation step that are sort of very... Uh, in the continuous time model that you're choosing, yeah. uh, it's the light of interactable for the jump principle. Uh, so it is in the sense that you can do matrix exponentials. And so basically, you, you can keep the eigen decomposition at the start of the day, and then you use the verbal subsequent times. So it's kind of, even though it costs S cubed to do that decomposition at the start, the cost of doing that is independent of the time horizon. So it's sort of cheap at that level, if that makes sense. Okay. We can talk more about it later. Okay. Um, yeah, and so, so one thing that's sort of unique to the graph filter smoother relative to the previous things is that there's no systematic bias induced by this filtering by this filtering method aside from this decoupling approximation that we've made for everything else. Everything else induces some sort of you know Gaussian to non-Gaussian approximation error or Monte Carlo approximation error, whereas this one is sort of nominally exact modulo the decoupling approximation. Uh, yeah, and so we have this sort of nice summary table which says you know for the different methods, how are we modeling skills. How ambitious are we being with our tracking, essentially? Are we tracking point estimates, parametric or full distributions? How is parameter estimation handled? And what yeah. sort of additional sources of bias? So this is sort of a nice for a think the first application, we'll see how we go. Okay, so the, the goal of our, our sort of experiment in this paper is to replicate a realistic workflow. So at present, the applications are not life changing, but they sort of uh, they show you that this uh, workflow is very sort of easy to use, easy to swap out different things, and you can sort of test how things are working quite nicely. So what we wanted to do is evaluate different models, getting sort of qualitatively confident comparison with what they achieve. And I think uh, the result happened was we would have say four or five years of data per competition. We'd use the first three or four to do parameter estimation, and then we'd sort of do uh, simulated online testing for the remaining years. Okay. Um, yeah, and so we use sort of filtering and smoothing to do online prediction and retrospective evaluation in those final years. And so, the, you know, one of the broad aims of what we're doing here is to sort of separate the modeling concerns, which you know, is where your expert information about the sport should come in, you write down your model, and then from there, things can be relatively generic. You can use these sort of general purpose methods. And there's a sort of uh, like your five factors, which sound like the Okay. So the, the first example is sort of a very simple exploratory one, which is based on football in the lead up to the 2023 World Cup. And I think here particularly we focus on what's happening for the Argentinian national team. And so, so one thing that's nice to highlight here is the, the different approaches. So here we have Hilo in the top left, True Skill up in the top right, the sequential Monte Carlo or bottom left down here, and then the sort of exact discrete method down up the bottom right corner. Uh, from here, you can sort of observe the different skill representations and see just how much information you're getting out of them, right? So if you, if you just marginalized and looked at the predictions of each matches, you wouldn't see the difference between the approaches so much, whereas here you really highlight, you know, with ELO, you have a very coarse representation of what's happening. With true skill, you sort of get a bit more information. And for these latter methods, you can sort of see, see things in a much more fine-grained way, you know, which, which has its benefits and costs, but at least there's an appreciable difference. And so what we do, if you look at uh, what's happening down the horizontal axis here. You see the results of each match. So in the first match, they lose to Saudi Arabia. In the second match, they win against Mexico, and so on. And sort of, uh, you know, we confirm our obvious intuitions that the influence of different matches, you know, makes things go up and down roughly as we expect. There's a particularly uh, illustrative point at the first one where Argentina lose to Saudi Arabia, who in the real world are ranked much lower than Argentina. Right? And we see a much more dramatic shift in their skill estimates across all of the models, which is sort of consistent with what we'd expect. Um, moreover, in the final three models, where you have the option to do smoothing, which remember for ELO, there's no notion of smoothing in there, uh, you see that for the uh, purple models, which are the filtering uh, distributions, things change quite a bit. Whereas with the benefit of hindsight, all of these smoothing distributions in green are more stable. Right? You see that 
you sort of have the know it all effect where you say, ah, with hindsight, I knew this is what was happening. Yeah. So that's what this is. Um, I'll just describe roughly what the, the other services uh, talk about without going into the details, but we'll touch on that later. Essentially, we have an experiment on women's tennis where we're looking at grammar estimation and how stable this is for the different approaches. Uh, we study the uh, English Premier League to sort of use the smoothing law to look at a retrospective evaluation of the change in managers for the Tottenham Hotspur football team over time. And uh, we also sort of look at prediction directly where we see that depending on the observation model, using more sophisticated statistical models can be useful or pretty marginal. But yeah, just to wrap up, so the point of today has been to sort of give an introduction to the skill rating problem for competitive yeah. sports and to talk about how you can handle the modeling sort of variously along the scale from mathematical to statistical to specifically state space models and to see what sort of a general treatment can be given to that approach. Um, what I'd like to highlight is you have this intertwining of the three input problems for state space models in this, many statistical settings. You need to solve the filtering well, the parameter estimation, and the smoothing well to get the whole story. At least uh, this is our experience. What's uh, very much accommodated by the framework we take is that there's various extensions which are natural to put in here. And in a way, this is what we're working on at the moment is to be more convinced of that model. But things like adding in covariant information, context information, like you know the weather and uh, other observations, uh, Handling things like the score rather than just um, which team won, for example, different random effects, and perhaps things like multivariate score representations is another challenge. So something I can comment on there is with football, a very common or you know a, a standard model to talk about is like the Dixon Fultz model, where essentially each team is modeled as having an offensive skill and a defensive skill, and the number of goals scored is sort of dependent on these things. So to bring that into our framework, we would still model these skills as being independent across players, but perhaps dependent within players. Okay, so you need to represent something two dimensional at that stage. Going to high dimensional skill representations for individual players, we think is probably quite difficult to do well within this framework. And then there's a few algorithmic extensions which we're sort of looking at at some horizon, which is to sort of uh, apply parallel and time techniques to sort of process the time series super quickly and to Look at things like uh, various reductions of Monte Carlo methods and ways of doing the parameter estimation on mine. So we did this sort of static PM way of things, but in principle, you would like to update the parameter estimates on mine. And I'll finish now. Thanks. You have time for like one question. Thanks. That was very nice. Um, one thing that I would like to ask, and, uh, and you know, I mean, it's an open question, it's not a skill rating. So basically, what happens is that usually uh, skill rating systems ignore the format of the competition. As in, like the number as of sets like, of tennis? No, as in, like if it's a, a round robin format ah. or, or a playoff format, right? So basically, th this is not perhaps so important for the skill estimation per mm -hmm. se, but it's very important for the variance of the skill. Right? Okay. So it plays a role in the right, in the right game. So for example, if you have a playoff format, you know that the result of the game today will determine what are the future competitions. Yes. So is there any way to accommodate this sort of thing? So uh, now that you have like this very nice split of, of, of state and observation. Yeah, it's it's a good question. We haven't thought about it carefully for sure. The the natural thing to say is if it's something which fits in nicely to modifying the observation model or the dynamics, then of course everything is good. Like modifying the dynamics. Because... Yeah, it's a, it's almost a bit related to what Terry was asking yeah. earlier about having a bit of feedback. There. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be it would be interesting to see whether it's straightforward to derive, you know, a, a, a way of doing the pr prediction step whilst incorporating this. Uh, I suspect it might be fine, but we'd have to look into it. And also, you know, like in, in, in games like tennis, for example, this happens a lot, right? Depending on where you are on the rating scale, if you have like so many options. Yeah. You, know, you, you compete with people, right? So you will never see a competition of a very high scoring uh, person with a very low. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mainly because if, if, the, if the low scoring person wins, they will destroy the rating of the high yes. scoring <laughs> We'll we'll have a think about that. I think I need to do some reading. Thank you.
Thank you. We can keep the discussion up first with a copy. Uh, let's say the speaker. I'm sorry for the now inconvenience online. Uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. 